everybody here this morning, and uh, thank the Lord for this opportunity to meet together. Let's turn in our course books to page 12. Everybody take a deep breath. This is the testimony of grace. John Newton wrote this hymn. Our hymn book only has about four verses, and yet this is all one story from beginning to end. I know that any that the Lord has taught can identify and testify that this is indeed how God shows grace to sinners. So, a little bit lengthy, but let's just sing this to the glory of the Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now and found was blind, but now I see. In evil one I took on of our shame and fear till a new object met in my sight and stopped my wild career I saw one hanging on in agony and blood, who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood, sure never till. My latest breath, and I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. I and felt the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins, his blood had shed and helped to nail him there. Alas, not what I did, but all my tears were vain. Where could my trembling soul be For I, the Lord, has slain a sad snare. 
remembered his mercy and his truth toward the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a jo joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of the song. With trumpets and sound of cornet, make a joyful noise before the Lord the king, let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together. Before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth, with the righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. And we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to read this psalm, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord, the right hand of the Father, the holy arm, your Lord, our salvation, and your Lord, our righteousness. He who can see brings forth this message in Jesus' name. Well, let's uh, take our bulletins and on the inside cover, we'll sing this hymn to the tune of Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. Let's think about the words as we sing them. True to the gospel. Praise ye the God of endless days. Lift up to him your voice in praise. Sing of his free and sovereign grace. He chose and loved our wicked race. The Father long ago 
For if there had been a law given which should have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture has concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as baptized into Christ have been have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor free, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Let us pray. Father God, we come before you now, and we thank you for the word. <clears throat> Lord, the, the scriptures has concluded that we are all under sin. The law is good, but the law did not save. The promises that were made in the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your redemption and your your sacrifice, Lord. You have justified us by your blood. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 215. Nor silver nor gold have obtained my redemption, nor riches of earth could have saved my poor soul. The blood of the cross is my only foundation, the death of my Savior now maketh me whole. I'm redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Bought with the blood, the blood of Jesus. Precious price of love untold. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption. The guilt of my conscience to heavy had grown. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. The death of my Savior could only redeem. I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Bought with the price, the blood of Jesus, precious price above untold. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption. The holy commandment forbade me draw near. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. The death of my Savior removeth my fear. I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. All with the price, the blood of Jesus, precious price of love untold. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption. The way into heaven could not thus be bought. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. The death of my Savior, redemption hath wrought. I'm redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Bought with the price, the blood of Jesus, precious price of love untold. Years ago, we had a dear elderly lady that attended here. She's since passed on, but I'd be preaching along just like you're saying there, nothing but the blood. She stopped me and she said, Do you believe that? And 
I said, yes, I do. That's why I'm preaching it. And she says, so do I. <laughs> I kind of missed that. I could hear her voice as I was singing that at this year old hotel. What a blessed testimony. All right, David's coming to read for us. Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed, for there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, and over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For through the offense of one, may he be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. And the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses and <coughs> justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace. And that the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. More of the law entered, that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, Grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness and to eternal life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, the first Adam brought the sin and death to all men by his sin. The second Adam saved the chosen people from their sin by his own righteousness. Open our hearts to look to Christ and Christ alone. Be with kings and preaches your word. Amen. Condemnation and salvation. That's the title of this message. I pray that those two words ring in our hearts as we consider the Word of God. I get people asking me all the time, why did God ordain a fallen world? Well, what would be salvation were there not a fallen world? What would be grace were it not against the backdrop of sin? all gone into these jewelry stores and when they want to display the most beautiful diamond what do they do they put it in a little box or whatever it is and they have black velvet behind it so when you walk up and look at it you're thinking wow that diamond is beautiful and I'd say that as the Lord has taught me over the years that's how I see God's purpose in salvation what would be salvation had there not been the condemnation? And I dare say this portion of scripture the Lord has used in my own heart over the years to help me have a clearer view of exactly why things are the way they are. And I trust that as we study this, the Lord bring even more clarity. I don't, I don't wanna let you think that somehow I've got this. Every time I read this, there's something different and new concerning Christ and concerning salvation that the Lord makes plain. But this text here in Romans 5, 12 to 21, answers really two essential questions that are on everybody's mind. If they've ever given some thought as to their own state before God as sinners and how it is that God saves the sinners, well, this portion right here answers those two questions. The first question that it answers is, what is the origin of sin? Did sin just creep up somewhere? Or what is the origin of sin? And then on the other side, what is true righteousness before God? As the scriptures clearly state, without a righteousness that answers to God's righteousness, none will see God. So 
Don't be looking in here thinking, I've got to get going and get working on my righteousness so that I have something to answer God when I stand before him. You're too late. Because this righteousness that God has purposed, he didn't purpose that it come through those that he saves. He purposed that it come through the one who saves. And it's just as clear and plain and distinct as that, very simply. And I like to give you this up front in case your mind wanders like it always does, but here is the answer to these two questions. Sin, as far as the origin of sin, death, judgment, and condemnation came through a man called Adam. That's the answer to that question right there. It came through another. And so in answer to the question, well, what is true righteousness then before God? Righteousness, and that word righteousness means rightness, or justness, and that's where we get the word justification. Righteousness comes by another man, not just any man, but another man, and by God's grace alone in him, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just as simple as that. You'd like to take and draw a line down the middle of the paper, put condemnation over here, and put salvation over here, and then right under condemnation or above condemnation, go, go ahead and put Adam. Because that's how it was brought about. And if you want to know salvation and righteousness, go ahead and put the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no in-between. And so that's what I want us to see here. Just taking the scripture for what it says. This isn't complicated. People like to complicate it because they don't agree with it. They'll try to manipulate it a little bit, change the answer, just because they don't like what it says. But guess what? It's, this is God's word. You're not going to change it. So as a result, that's the, the, the first point I want you to see here in Romans 5.12. As a result of Adam's sin, Adam was the first man God created, and he fell. He didn't catch God by surprise because the scriptures tell us that God had already foreordained, even before the foundation of the world, the people that he would save. So that means that God had already foreordained the fall of Adam. He created him in an upright state, but now here's an important distinction. He didn't create him righteous. Had he created Adam righteous, then he would have never fallen. There's only been one man that has ever been created righteous, and that's his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As a man, yes, he was God, but when he came in the flesh, he came to earn and establish a righteousness that would answer to God's righteousness in every jot and tittle, thought, word, and deed. And by that righteousness, that righteous obedience, even as Adam disobeyed, so the man, the last Adam, he's called, would be made in righteousness, created in righteousness. And that righteousness is what God then approved and put to the account of everyone for whom he died. So we're looking at this, condemnation on one side, salvation on the other. And as a result of Adam's sin, it says here, doesn't it, in verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered the world. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? And death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. That's so important for us to understand. When it says here, for all that all have sinned, you can put there under have or next to it, did sin. That's the way it is in the Greek. All did sin. Where, where did all sin? In Adam, when he fell. And you say, well, I wasn't even there. Well, that's probably a good thing, because had you been there, you'd have done the same thing. But here then we see God's message of salvation, just as in Adam all sinned, it was by the work of another, 
guess what? The good news is that by the work of another, God saves sinners that are fallen in Adam, saves those that he purposed from before the foundation of the world. And therefore, things are the way they are because of that very first man, Adam. I think we understand representation, our governments by representation, like it or not. Whatever decisions they're making on our behalf affect us. If you've got a good representative, then you live a quiet, peaceful life. If you've got a bad representative, trouble ahead. That's representation. But here in the scripture, we see the same representation. That death, here it says in verses 13 and 14, reigned before the law was given. Notice that, for until the law, sin was in the world already. When it says before the law, it's talking about God giving that law to Moses. And yet, that didn't come until years later. But sin was already in the world. People running around worried about keeping the Ten Commandments. All it took for Adam was one commandment. And he disobeyed and fell. And because of that, then, death was brought in and passed upon all men. You're not going to get away from it. This is why even babies die. You say, well, why do babies die? They're sinners. They're born sinners. I know we look at them and how cute they are, how nice, but I always say they're just vipers and diapers. They live long enough, they're going to prove themselves to be sinners. If you don't believe it, take a little baby and in the middle of the night when that baby wants something, boy, it's going to let you know. Scream, get angry, mad, turn red. You say, why is that? Well, it's a sinner. You're holding a sinner in your arms. So we see the importance then of this representation by one man sin entered the world and uh, it said here but sin is not imputed where there is no law. You may wonder what that part is talking about for until the law sin was in the world so we know that's referring to Adam but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Think about how righteousness was established where the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world and took on him the charge of that sin by which his people were guilty in Adam and put it away. So what it's dealing there with is with contrast. The law, until the law of sin was already in the world, that is from Adam. But now that another has come, this is where Paul is going with this, and taken the charge of that sin upon himself, then sin can no longer be imputed to those for whom Christ died because he took it away. Where there's no law, you can't accuse somebody of sin. And that's what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. There was the law of sin in Adam by which we stood condemned, but there's the law of righteousness in Christ by which when Christ had finished the work, that righteousness that he earned established was imputed to the account of those for whom he died. And guess what? Now there's no more sin. It can't be because the law has been satisfied. If you want to, to help you there in verse 13, just put that law satisfied. It's not that God set aside the law when it says sin is not imputed where there's no law. But the law has been satisfied. That's why there's no more condemnation, no more sin that can be imputed. So this is a very profound argument that Paul is writing about here as we study on down through it. Just as through one man, sin entered the world, and the Apostle Paul obviously is referring back to Genesis chapter 3 as being when sin entered the world and that shows then that Adam and Eve were not fictitious characters. There's some that try to reason around this and try to make Adam and Eve as just being made up fictitious characters. But what they did going all the way back to the garden however many thousands of years ago 
has been such a fall that it has affected everything that we are to this present day. And here's the thing, if you're wrong on the fall, you're wrong on it all. Unless you see yourself in that fallen state and not just fallen out of fellowship. There's some that argue that when Adam fell, well, he fell out of fellowship with God. No, he was wounded and died. The Lord said that the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. He lived to be several hundred years old. So some look at that and say, well, see, it, he didn't die. He died spiritually. Remember that as soon as Adam and Eve partook of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that immediately they were plunged into a fallen state themselves. Why? Because they recognized they were naked. Before then, there wasn't any shame. There wasn't any guilt. But now, no fear. But what did they do? They ran and hid among the trees where God had said they could eat all along. There was only one tree, God said, in that entire garden that they should not eat. That was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But once they had disobeyed, than uh, any thing that they had enjoyed to that point. They didn't know shame. They didn't know guilt. They didn't know fear until sin entered. And when sin entered, suddenly now they were fallen. And so to Paul here writing, Adam was more than just a, an historic figure. There's some that deny that he was an historic figure. They just say these are made up uh, stories. I sat through a conference back in 1990 in uh, France. They invited a bunch of reformed pastors in from all over Europe. And they were supposedly giving papers on uh, different aspects of scripture. And they brought in some man from South Africa that was, had his doctorate and he was supposed to be an expert on Genesis. Mm -hmm. And I I was invited not to take part of the discussions, but I was the keynote speaker every night. <clears throat> and I had three nights to preach. And after I'd preached the first night, because the Lord directed me to preach out of Jude. Yeah, the book of Jude, after the first night, there was such an uproar that the man who had invited me came and said, we got to do something because they're about ready to kill you. I said, well, if you don't want me to preach, I won't. I can get on that airplane tomorrow and head on out. And he said, no, but can't you just present it in a different way so that, and I said, nope. And you know, those folks sat there, they invited me. It's like inviting a guest. Well, I'm gonna, you're going to, you know, you're going to eat what I prepared. And uh, so the Lord directed me to finish the three days, but boy, there was, there was gnashing of teeth. But this man, I remember during the day they were giving their papers. He, after his first presentation, I got up and started walking. I didn't attend anymore. I just couldn't. It, it was a denial of Scripture. But he was saying that all of this was an allegory taken from pagan literature about the gods that were ruling over men and uh, how the men rebelled and so God had to act in uh, condemnation. And that's how he presented it. He didn't believe this to be the Word of God. So you've got that extreme and then you've got others that all they want to do is look at Adam as a historic figure. The first man. And they can uh, wax eloquent talking about what it must have been like for him to, to be in the garden. And uh, you know his, his name Adam actually means man. Or from that you get the word humanity. And so some try to reason and how it is that all of us are descendants of Adam and give a lecture on humanity. But I will tell you from what Paul is telling us here, it's more than just that. This has to do with representation. That God placed Adam in that garden for one reason. That he might be the representative of that race that should come through him. And that by him, by that one man, sin entered the world. Not in any other way. It was through Adam. And therefore Adam is the one in Scripture described 
as the author or the, the one through whom sin fell. I know that there are those that say, well, Eve partook first and then gave to Adam. And they want to say that Adam was off somewhere else at that time and so wasn't aware. No, he was there. When you go back and look at it in Genesis chapter 3, as soon as she partook, she gave it to him and he did eat. And if you look over in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, so this is describing condemnation. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. It doesn't say by one woman sin entered into the world. I know that Adam, when the Lord questioned him, he tried to blame the woman, the woman blamed the serpent. That's what the fall does. It never takes the blame. But here in 1 Tim Timothy 2, it says concerning Adam in verse 14, Adam was not deceived. See, Eve had not even been formed yet from his side when God had given that commandment that they should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go follow that sequence back there in Genesis. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So why was Adam then blamed for the sin when it was Eve who partook? Well, it's because Adam didn't stop her. Therein was the sin. By one man, sin entered the world. He, he watched and observed everything that Satan was doing through that serpent to deceive her. And that's what it says here, doesn't it? The woman being deceived was in the transgression. But the blame fell squarely on Adam. He was not deceived. That means he went into this thing, his eyes wide open. That's why the scriptures say by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. Death entered the world and spread to all of Adam's race. There's not one that's going to escape. There's not one. That's why I said when people imagine that every child that comes into the world they're starting over with a clean slate. No. That little baby is infected with the sin of Adam. And that's why it says there that in verse 14, it's not that just sin entered, but nevertheless what? Death reigned. The idea of reigning there means ruling over. This shows how sinners are brought in the world. It's, it's because of that sin of Adam that it reigns. This talks about our depravity. You're never going to get out of this being a sinner. Even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Here we go again. People like to argue, well, I, I, if I'd have been there, I wouldn't have done what Adam did. Yes, you would have. Or I wasn't there, so I can't be accountable for his sin. Here it says that even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam. Whatever you can think of as an excuse, it's no excuse. Sorry. You're still born in Adam, and therefore you are subject not only to the sin, but what? The death. Notice that in verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned. See, that's the ultimate evidence of being a sinner. It's death. Physical death, spiritual death, and unless... Christ has paid your sin debt, eternal death. That's how the scriptures describe this death. And there's none that ex escape because up there in verse 12 it says it's passed, it's already passed. So death passed already upon all men, for that all did sin. That passing has to do with a, a passing of judgment. That's why babies when they're born in this world are born sinners. They're not born towards sin. They're born sinners. David said in Psalm 51 and verse 5, I know this gets some mothers upset because they like to think of their babies as being just innocent and a lot of people do. They want to think that's where that teaching came about the age of accountability where somehow a child is not accountable 
for their sin until a certain age. And they keep arguing, what is that age? Some say it's 12, some say it's 19. And if a child dies before that age, then somehow they're going to heaven because they didn't reach the age of accountability. The Bible knows nothing of age of accountability. Here in Psalm 51 and verse 5, David said what? Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. He's talking about not from birth, but from conception. That once that seed is conceived, a sinner is conceived, shapen in iniquity. And it says, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That's the word, conceive. We come forth from the womb, speaking lies, David says in another part. So this is the origin of sin. I told you that's the answer. What's the origin of sin? It's in Adam. And the fact that as descendants of Adam were born sinners. That death sentence has already passed upon us. I would say this, you know, people complain, they say, well, I don't know if I should be blamed for Adam's sin. Well, here's the good news. Again, coming back to the two Adams. <laughs> because if in Adam I was declared a sinner, that means then by the righteousness of another, I can be declared righteous. I don't have anything to do with that. Just like I didn't have anything to do with the sin, I don't have anything to do with being made righteous. That's the work of another. So if we weren't made sinners by Adam, then you could say in the same manner that it wouldn't be fair for us to be made righteous by the Lord. It would be to each his own. And I'll tell you, if that were the case, there would be none saved. We can't get out of this sin condemnation, but thank God, if God's purpose our salvation, we don't have to get out of it because that's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, verses 13 and 14, there's a lot here for us to consider. 13 and 14 are actually answering the objection of those that say, well, I thought we were sinners because we broke the law. No, you were sinners, that's what it says there, for until the law of sin was already in the world. So it's not a matter of you having broken the law that made you a sinner. We know that the root of it, of being made a sinner, was because of Adam, and not because we broke the law ourselves. Our breaking the law is simply the evidence of what we are already in Adam. If someone says, well, I don't, I don't believe I fell in Adam. Well, how's your life going right now? How do you match up compared to God's law and holiness? You'd have to declare yourself to be utterly condemnable. We know that this, because of Adam's sin, and through him death, all of this was in the world even before the law was ever given. So the law was too late to prevent sin, but it wasn't designed to prevent it. And it was too weak to save from sin and death. That's evident, because when the Lord brought the law, it didn't change what man was. In fact, as we read there a little further down, that the law was added, that sin might abound, that it might be made even more evident of us being sinners. And so when it says there, nevertheless, death reigned, you talk about a reign of terror. Think about what's in your heart and what it is to be under this condemnation. Of Adam, the total merciless reign of death. Even before the law was given at the time of Moses, that proves right there that man was under sin even before the law. Death reigned even over those that had not sinned in the exact way that Adam did, showing that sin is at work where? Already in the heart. Already done. So that's where we get now to the contrast between Adam and the Lord Jesus Christ. It says there in the last part of verse 14 that Adam was, what does it say there? The figure of him that was to come. 
So now is where Paul is getting into the distinction between the first Adam and the last Adam. But there it says that he was a figure. That word means a type. So we might look at that as an anti-type. There's types and then there's anti-types. When it says he was a figure of him that was to come, we know that Christ came in the flesh, but he was sinless. So in no way could it be said that he was like Adam, because Adam was not sinless. He fell. But when it says that he was a type of Adam, that word figure means a picture. Don't we like pictures? That helps us understand a representation of the Lord Jesus. See, both Adam and the Lord were completely sinless in the beginning. But the separation came when Adam fell, but our Lord Jesus Christ continued. Where Adam disobeyed, Christ obeyed. That's where we see the importance of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But both of their works that they did had an effect on their race. Adam, it brought what? Condemnation. Christ, on his race, see there's a distinction made there. Christ didn't come to represent all of Adam's race, but out of all of Adam's fallen race, God had already chosen those that he gave to his son. And when he, when Christ came as their representative, everything that Christ did and has done then is put to the account of his race. And therein we see how Adam was a type of Christ, both representatives, both of them, what they did affected those that they represented. But oh, the gracious gift that we find in Christ. You see, that's what it says there in verse 15. Not as the offense, so also the free gift. That's why I say he's, he's representing Christ here as, a, as an anti-type of Adam. Not as the offense. The offense of Adam passed upon all his race, but Christ had no offense to pass to his race. He, rather, he took that offense. And in return, what? The free gift. There it is the difference, then the contrast. The gracious gift of salvation in Christ is not like Adam's transgression. Because Adam's brought death, it brought judgment, it brought condemnation on all his race, and thereby all of Adam's race was made to be sinful. While, what did the work of the Lord Jesus Christ bring? See, nothing in this has to do with my efforts. I didn't do anything to become a sinner, nor do I do anything to become righteous. I can't claim that. Because righteousness, just like sin, death, and judgment, came through Adam, so righteousness and justification and free grace, that's really what all the rest of this chapter is about, comes to those for whom Christ is the representative. In verses 15 to 19, if you were to ask me to summarize it, that's the sum of it. It's the contrast between Adam's work and the work of the Lord Jesus. So get your paper out again, and now drive down the middle, and you can just easily put these at each side. There. What pertains to Adam, who I am in Adam, what pertains to Christ, who I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. There he says in verse 15, but not as the offense, so is the free gift. Adam gave an offense that had consequences for the entire race of Adam. That's why the whole world lies in wickedness. You can travel the world over, babies are born every day, but I'm telling you, a sinner's born every day. Around the world, it doesn't matter of color, race, culture, creed. We see the effects of Adam's sin, and there are billions in the world 
And there have been billions and billions and trillions since Adam fell. But every single one of them has come into this world a condemned sinner. We shouldn't be surprised that God sends sinners to hell. Everybody gets all upset and thinking, well, you know, that's the consequence. That's how death reigns. Death reigns. It's not only physical death, but spiritual death, eternal death. What should amaze us is that God purposed that he take out of Adam's fallen race of people from every tribe, nation, tongue, and give them to his son, and that by his representation. Notice the word there in verse 15. It's a free gift. You say, why? Why did he just say a gift? Because we don't understand. I've often said one of the hardest things for any of us to accept is grace. We do it all the time. Here, let me get your meal for you today. And you're like, oh, no, I can get my, no, I want to I want to pay your meal. Okay, well, let me get yours the next time. We can't even accept a gift. I had a friend that often said, he said, if someone offers to pay something for you, take it. Because if they didn't mean it, they'll never offer it again. And if they did, it'll be a blessing to them. But this is why you see, you know, the word grace. Why do we have to talk about free grace? Because we don't understand. We think that somehow there's a little bit of our effort in there that God expects. No. Free gift. How hard is that to understand? It's impossible for a sinner. And we're going to continue to wrestle with it. You know, if you don't believe it, next time you sin, stop and think about where your mind goes. Ooh, what do I have to do to make this right? down on my knees, ask God forgiveness, trying my best not to do it again. See, all that's works. That's all the result of being a sinner and that. It'll condemn you. The only place to look is the work of Christ. He either took it all or he didn't take it. If he took it all, that's why it says up there, sin is not imputed where there is no law. I can't tell you how many times the Lord's brought that home to my mind. No law that's going to condemn Ken Weimer, even though I know myself to be a sinner. Why? Because Christ paid for it in his shed blood. So that's about as far as we're going to get today. There's a whole lot more. We're going to come back to this 15 to 21 and take a look at it. But the contrast between Adam's work and our Lord Jesus' work. But I pray that what we've heard is a great encouragement to our souls. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 272. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the sovereign rock I stand, all underground is sinking sand. All underground is sinking sand. His oath is covered and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then wins all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Rest in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before.
Lord of Rome. Blood Christ the solid, rock and stand, all of your ground is sinking sand. All of your ground is sinking sand. Rest in whose righteousness alone? Says, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. That's the only way. All right, we'll be dismissed and look forward to the next time. Both of them.